Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about the Melaleuca MLM and the CEO who runs it, Frank L. Vandersloot. And I don't know what it is about the name Vandersloot, but it sounds like a billionaire villain from a kid's movie. But anyway, I'm gonna try and stick to a timeline here between Vandersloot and Melaleuca so you can get an idea of how they both grew together. And that timeline starts in 1948. So without much further eloquence, let's get right into the video. Vandersloot was born on August 14th, 1948. He lived on a farm in Idaho and began to save for college early on. According to Forbes, he manned the farm's cream separator twice a day, turning it by hand to separate cream from milk. His dad let him sell the excess cream not used by the family, netting him $2.50 per week. He took jobs on neighboring farms too, building fences, putting up hay, and operating tractors. As a teenager, he joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, becoming a Mormon, and then graduated from BYU in 1972 with a bachelor's in marketing. Now, Mormons and MLMs honestly do go hand in hand in a lot of these videos, but today isn't about that. I just thought it was interesting to mention, and it will be important later on. Now, once Vandersloot graduated, he was working for ADP, then Cox Communications. At this point, the Forbes article says he went off on his own to start Melaleuca in 1985, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Idaho Falls Magazine states that he started selling off beef jerky for a local businessman, Roger Ball, then left to cut his teeth at Fortune 500 companies. He eventually became a regional vice president at ADP and vice president at Cox Communications. Before returning to work with Ball 13 years later at a new startup of oil of Melaleuca, Vandersloot had spent his time wisely, grooming himself in the fine art of marketing and business management. I had made it in corporate America, he said. Where I worked, everything was measured. I performed well and as a result, got lots of promotions. They were good to me. The experience prepared him for later success. I tell young sprouting entrepreneurs all the time, go get a job for 10 years before you even think of doing something on your own. You will learn to do it right, then you won't have to go back and reinvent all those wheels. And I have to pause with reading this and I have to say that that's not always accurate. And in some cases saying that kind of language can actually hurt some young entrepreneurs that actually are bound to be successful. If I were 18, 19 or 20 and considering joining this company, I don't really think that Vandersloot would stop me. And I've seen time and time again, especially with MLMs like Cutco and Vema, how they target college students. Even if Melaleuca's demographic is different, you can't tell me that there's absolutely no young people involved because he wants them to get a job before they try running their own business with Melaleuca. Not that Melaleuca is your own business, Business anyway, but that's just the language that is used, treating it as if it's our own business, but we all know that's not real. But that quote really angers me because I feel like he's trying to sound like this helpful guy who offers business advice while in the meantime, scams people with a pyramid scheme type company, but more on that in just a little while. In his own case, it didn't take long for him and his colleagues to retool their business model just seven months after Vandersloot had been recruited to run the new company. One early partner by the name of Don Miller had enticed Ball and his family to invest in a 20,000 acre ranch in Australia called Main Camp. It supposedly had about 80% of all the world's Melaleuca tea leaves grown on it. The genus of this particular tree only flourishes in a small area of South Wales, Australia, and Miller claimed that a huge percentage of the oil was produced there, Vandersloot said. Well, well, it really wasn't true. The balls had made the considerable investment in the property only to discover that most of the oil they were getting didn't even come off the ranch. I went to my partners and we decided to close that whole deal down, Vandersloot said. They got rid of his other partner in Australia. So now Ball family had 70%, I had 30%. We started a brand new company and named it Melaleuca Inc. We changed the product line and moved to a new business model. It was a big change, but we didn't make it a big deal that we had changed it. Maybe we should have. That new business model obviously was an MLM model. Another article on the topic goes on a little bit deeper and explains that instead of owning 80% of the tea trees in Australia, it owned closer to 5%. More troubling, the health value of the plant's oil the whole basis of the business was itself questionable. Inventory was accumulating in distributors depots. Something drastic had to be done. So Vandersloot changed everything. He bought all the inventory, trademarks, and product formulas. He gave the company its current name and he hired a research and development department tasked with cooking up new recipes. They eventually garnered nine US patents in the process of providing Vandersloot with products like an energy bar that is said to inhibit a fat burning prevention enzyme, a benzophenone infused shampoo that is supposed to prevent sun damage to hair. The only thing I'll really give Vandersloot and his MLM credit for here is that they're more upfront with how difficult it is to earn money. Vandersloot himself tells 
tells new recruits they're starting off as customers on the bottom of a towering pyramid, which has just got to be one of the most accurate descriptions of an MLM I think I've ever heard. I talk a lot about how easy it can be to fall for these scams, but if someone's fallen for one, I'm less inclined to feel sympathetic considering the CEO has described it as a pyramid at least in Melaleuca's case, that is. Now you know about the company and Vandersloot's history, though we're going to get into the company itself. First of all, their website is an absolute mess. It reminds me of the MyPillow website. It's a gigantic pain to navigate. It's like an entire page of just weird advertisements. They state that every product has been developed and manufactured to stand out from the competition. Each must be superior in a very clear and relevant way to the products you might otherwise use. That means they are researched, refined, and scrutinized before they ever go to market. Melaleuca preferred members only deserve the best, and that is exactly what Melaleuca is committed to providing. Melaleuca has all these supplements that are supposed to be about promoting healthy joints, blood pressure support, fitness bars, you name it. They've also got cleaning products and say that though their bottles are smaller, their concentration is higher. However, the page to their studies seems a little bit suspicious to say the least. There's no doubt that it works in the findings from Freeberg, but even Freeberg themselves looks really shady. I actually did a bit of digging on this German research center and some studies say that Freeberg doesn't exactly have the best reputation. It reads, in a large unselected sample of clinical research projects approved by a German research ethics committee, only about half of the started studies were published. In addition, 16% of the started studies were discontinued. Crucial information such as study funding differed between protocols and publications in about 20% of published trials. If only part of the accumulated research data are accessible for those potentially interested, scarce research sources are wasted. Furthermore, healthcare professionals and patients cannot make decisions based on all available evidence and other researchers may build future projects on an incomplete or even biased database. And I don't know, to me, that just, doesn't really sound legit. If you like supplements and you want to use them, you do you. But the studies they release rub me the wrong way. In addition to the Freeberg study, they also completed the Sterling study in Cincinnati, USA. In total though, between both studies, they've only got about 100 participants, which is a pretty small sample size. Their statements haven't been evaluated by the FDA. They're sure to say that in the finest print possible, but the whole thing kind of reads like an advertisement because everyone who tried it benefited from Melaleuca products apparently. The fact of the matter is that most clinical trials like this are industry sponsored. And because of this, most of the products in these trials are likely to be recommended or have positive results. I'm not saying this means every single clinical trial out there is absolute garbage, but the Freeberg and Sterling one to me, reek of them being paid off. Each of them had about 50 participants for a few months and the studies didn't even seem to have a placebo group or account for, I don't know, maybe if that person was eating healthier or exercising more, or if they were dieting anyway. It's hard to trust that when there's no control in the study, there's no like understanding of what the participants were doing in their outside time or any additional explanations as to how those results possibly happened. As for these peak performance packs that they reviewed, I can't say I'm really thrilled by looking at them because they don't don't have anything exactly revolutionary in them. There's grapeseed extract, green tea extract, ginkgo extract, then gelatin and magnesium and a few other ingredients. Grapeseed extract has been promoted as a dietary supplement, sure, but there's not enough high quality evidence to rate its effectiveness either. Again, that's not me saying that this definitely does or does not work, but I do think it's safe to say that this is not revolutionary. Aside from the direct selling method, they also have an Amazon page where they sell multivitamins, cleaners, all that stuff. They're really quite quite pricey as is the case with many MLMs, but judging by the ratings, it seems like the Huns are still out here buying these things. If you like or need supplements, again, you do you. I would just rather see someone purchase supplements from a company that doesn't operate kind of like a pyramid scheme or you know where the CEO describes them as customers at the bottom of a pyramid. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Anyway, the first sign of trouble for Melaleuca and Vandersloot came in 1991. Between 1991 and 1997, Melaleuca was investigated by Michigan regulators, the Idaho Attorney General's Office, and the US Food and Drug Administration for marketing regulation. One source states, in 1991, Melaleuca entered into a voluntary compliance assurance with the Idaho Attorney General's Office, which found that certain independent marketing executives of Melaleuca had violated Idaho law. Among other things, the agreement required Melaleuca 
Alaluka to ensure that its marketing executives would not suggest that the company or its marketing plan were endorsed by the FDA or the state attorney general, and that it would not use photos of current or former Idaho attorney generals in its marketing materials. The company was ordered to pay the state $1,000 for the cost of the investigation. The state knocked off $500 in recognition of the company's cooperation. In 1992, the Michigan Attorney General's office investigated Melaleuca's business practices. The Attorney General alleged that materials about a company program claimed participants were making $80,000 to $100,000 within one or two years, and that bonuses were paid simply for recruiting new participants, which is illegal in Michigan. The AG also alleged that literature from a Michigan participant made false and misleading representations that the company was endorsed by the Michigan Attorney General and the Federal Trade Commission. The assurance in this instance is very extensive and not our typical boilerplate, says Robert Ward Jr., the former Michigan Assistant Attorney General who drafted the agreement with Melaleuca. We seem to really nail them down to specific remedies not ordinarily required in these cases. We were concerned with earnings claims and their entire marketing program. Melaleuca did not admit wrongdoing, but it signed an agreement with the state assuring it would not engage in the marketing and promotion of an illegal pyramid, and it would enforce its own policies to prevent distributors from referring to the FDA, FTC, or Attorney General in its marketing materials. For a year, the state required the company to report monthly to the AG's office on the results of its effort to ensure compliance with the agreement. The Food and Drug Administration has also accused Melaleuca of deceiving consumers about some of its supplements, which the company claimed could treat clogged arteries or cure arthritis. All of these compliance assurances are available online. They're really not that hard to find. Even if Melaleuca didn't admit wrongdoing, I think someone here can easily tell that they messed up by letting this go unchecked. If you've got three separate regulators coming after you after just a few years of starting a business, well, there's probably a reason for that. Under this compliance assurance, the company promised they'd enforce the policy that their distributors would only use literature and materials ordered from Melaleuca, which has me wondering what sources these Huns were trying to use to support their claims in the first place let alone the fact that this $1,000 is only a slap on the wrist, but how many chances do these companies get? Claims like these happen a lot with MLMs, and I feel like the crackdowns need to be a lot harsher early on. And yet, at the same time Melaleuca was signing these compliance agreements to not be a pyramid scheme, even though Vandersloot described the company as a pyramid, Inc. Magazine included them on the list of the nation's 500 fastest growing private firms. Melaleuca would remain on that list for the next four years in a row. In 1991, the US Chamber of Commerce honored Melaleuca with its Blue Chip Enterprise Award. In spite of a poor economy, Melaleuca's sales increased from 29 million in 1990 to 105 million in 1991. The firm in 1991 prospered from the efforts of over 100,000 independent salespersons and also the company's 900 plus workers at its Idaho Falls, Pocatello, and Rexburg plants. In 1993, the company opened its new manufacturing plant in Knoxville, Tennessee to meet the growing need from consumers in the East. By 1997, the Knoxville plant would total 170,000 square feet. Is it just me or does this send just a series of mixed messages for anyone investigating Melaleuca at that time? Like, why didn't it? Like back then when this kind of research wasn't as accessible with the internet being what it was, I'd be inclined to think Melaleuca had to be a legitimate company. The US Chamber of Commerce awarded them while around the same time, the US Food and Drug Administration was warning them. Like, make up your mind. Shouldn't a company under investigation for being a pyramid scheme be exempt from these types of awards? This kind of shit makes it hard for potential distributors to know what's a scam and what isn't. And Melaleuca, being an MLM, needs those distributors' trust. And now it's time to take a quick break and talk about today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Okay, so we all know how a VPN protects your privacy and security online, right? Well, it's able to also take your TV watching game to the next level. And I know that's important since we got nothing else to do but be at home now. And you can use a VPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. Over the weekend, many people were probably watching the Super Bowl. I, however, used ExpressVPN to binge Doctor Who on UK's Netflix. It was so simple, I just fired up the ExpressVPN app, changed my location to the UK, refreshed Netflix, and voila, that was it. See, ExpressVPN hides your IP address and lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. You can choose from almost 100 different countries. So just think about all the different Netflix options you have available to you. And do you love anime? Well, use ExpressVPN to access Japanese Netflix and be spirited away. That was a good pun, wasn't it? If you visit my link right now, expressvpn.com slash MLM, you can get an extra three months free of ExpressVPN. Support the show, watch what you want and protect yourself online from people looking to use your information. 
Again, go to expressvpn.com slash MLM to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free when you sign up for a plan. Love you guys. Let's get back to the video. Melaleuca's success during this time relied on the efforts of its many distributors who began as marketing executives and could progress to higher levels as they recruited others and built a sales organization. Unlike some other direct marketing firms, Melaleuca published statistics on the annual income of its various distributor levels. At the entry level, marketing executives in 1996 averaged $93.17 in annual income with a maximum of $1,228.48. Melaleuca's top salespersons called executive directors reportedly averaged $131,818.58 in annual income in 1996, with a maximum at that level of $862,871.13. Of course, those executives were the teeny, teeny, tiny top percentage of the company, but those salaries lured people in thinking that, hey, I could achieve that too, when that's not the reality. Amela Luca's most successful salesperson at the time was Russell Paley of Teaneck, New Jersey. Paley began as a Melaleuca marketing executive in 1991 after a career with New Skin Enterprises, a large multi-level marketing firm in Provo, Utah. By 1996, Paley's sales organization for Melaleuca included about 6,500 persons, and it was reported in March 24, 1996, Idaho Falls Post Register that his organization accounted for sales of $218,000 in the month of January, 1996 alone. According to papers filed with the Idaho State Government, B and V Technology Inc., then headed by Frank Vandersloot as president, Alan Ball as secretary, and Roger Wright and Harold Ball as directors merged with Melaleuca Inc. on December 30th, 1993. The following year, Melaleuca became an international firm when it commenced sales in Canada through a separate firm called Melaleuca of Canada. Canadian product labels, catalogs, and sales materials were printed in both English and French. The following year, the company expanded into Argentina and later moved into Taiwan and Japan. Although the early and mid 90s should have been devastating for the company as they should have faced a hell of a lot of scrutiny for what they did, it was a prosperous time instead. They were expanding, making millions, and they even teamed up with Dr. John Foltz to take advantage of flavonoids. At the time, studies suggested that although the French had higher blood pressures and cholesterol levels than Americans, the red wine, the French drink, and the flavonoids in it kept them from having heart attacks. Flavonoids aren't just in wine, and this French paradox, as it was called, was later debunked. Well, not so much debunked, but it was a lot more complicated than, hey, just drink more wine. There's also portion sizing, processed foods, and a whole host of other factors to consider. But, you know, I guess Melaleuca doesn't really want to consider that when there's a potential quick fix and a way to get some fast cash. I wouldn't be surprised if they started claiming their products made you less likely to have a heart attack since they've already come dangerously close to downright making those statements on their website. However, the 90s weren't all good for Melaleuca and Vandersloot was doing some pretty despicable things himself. We'll start with the company. As one Forbes article puts it, a different problem emerged in 1998. When sales flattened, Vandersloot did some digging and discovered that some senior directors were living off their residuals and doing little in the way of recruitment. Result, a new policy that reduced payments to those who didn't bring in new converts or helped others do so. Since then, company revenues have grown at a compound annual rate of 12%. And I love how MLM say, oh, you can work on your own time and work whenever you want. And then they pull something like this. If someone worked their way all the way up to a senior director position, the sales of the company shouldn't depend on their new recruitments. This is why I feel like pyramid schemes and Ponzi schemes and you know MLMs all kind of go hand in hand. You need to keep an endless supply of downlines or customers or investors coming in. Otherwise, this will eventually collapse in on itself because in reality, the employees or the investors are the customers. I'm not saying no one but distributors buy MLM products, but Melaleuca relies on the recruits because they're the majority of the customer base. As irritated as this might make me though, it's Vandersloot's own personal decisions that are absolutely appalling. One source explains family values rank high among Vandersloot's priorities and have seemed to have fueled his involvement in politics, which began in 1999. That year, Vandersloot helped to underwrite an Iowa-wide billboard campaign campaign protesting a documentary that was supposed to be broadcast on public television that tried to show how teachers are dealing with homosexual issues that may come up in class or on the playground. 
In the words of the Spokane, Washington based spokesman review, proponents hope greater awareness will promote greater tolerance and decrease hostile incidents against homosexuals, the paper reported. To Vandersloot, the program threatened to turn children gay. Why is this public TV paid for by our tax dollars going to show this to our families, our children, he asked at the time. I'm really concerned that if this isn't stopped, a lot of little kids will watch this program and create questions they've never had, raise curiosities that they shouldn't have had at those ages. Ages. The billboards he funded, along with undisclosed other donors, asked rhetorically, should public television promote the homosexual lifestyle to your children? The letters were sky blue, except the words homosexual lifestyle, which were written in red. Think about it was scrawled below as if in crayon. The billboard campaign did not succeed in getting the program canceled. And I just, where do you start with this? There's no logic for it. Like what, what am I reading here? Like it's one thing to just have messed up beliefs with no evidence, but to go on and then try and project this publicly so far as to make anti LGBTQ billboards is just impressively ignorant and insulting. Plus this documentary wasn't even promoting a homosexual lifestyle to kids. By the sounds of things, it was a documentary made to spread awareness about people that already identify as homosexual and the challenges they may face growing up. Up, not to tell kids they should be gay too. Like many of you know, I'm part of the LGBTQ community and no one is going around saying kids should be gay. We're going to turn the kids gay, just like the fucking frogs. Like that's not, that's not what's going on here. The LGBTQ community wants more representation, yes but representation doesn't change who someone is or what they identify as. You don't turn gay. You don't choose your sexual orientation like that. People may be more accepting now, but does Vandersloot really believe people choose to be gay knowing they can be persecuted and judged when they come out? Unfortunately, it does get a lot worse. Maybe you just see him as an ignorant person with too much time and money right now, but this is only the beginning. Two years later, Forbes reports Vandersloot supported radio and TV spots knocking Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, Idaho Falls office because its New York headquarters had invited former President Clinton to speak at its bond conference. In 2002, one of the Vandersloot's favorite causes, Concerned Citizens for Family Values, bought ads against a candidate for state attorney general, a trial lawyer whom Vandersloot called a liberal's liberal. When Idaho's Republican Senator Larry Craig had to step down after being caught in a wide stance during an airport men's room sting, Vandersloot rented his Learjet to Governor Jim Reich as the latter campaigned for the vacant seat, Reich won. And in 2008, Vandersloot's wife gave $100,000 to the cause of passing Proposition 8. California's ballot initiative banning same-sex marriage, which in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals recently found unconstitutional. Earlier this month, a writer for the Sacramento Bee described Vandersloot as perhaps the single most influential campaign donor in Idaho. Over the years, he has helped fund an array of candidates, including governors and Idaho Supreme Court justices, and has taken on varied causes, challenging rules restricting the sale of raw milk and attacking public school teacher unions. Now, however, Vandersloot has become a financial figure of national national significance because of Citizens United and Willard Mitt Romney. Vandersloot became something of a public icon in Idaho and not everyone agreed with him, which is fine. People are allowed to disagree, right? Well, no, because if you criticize Vandersloot, you got sued. This became such a pattern with Vandersloot that one article called it chronic bullying threats to bring patently frivolous lawsuits against his political critics, magazines, journalists, and bloggers. Forbes, Mother Jones, and a local gay blogger in Idaho all had to remove articles that critically focused on his political and business practices. Mother Jones actually reposted the article and in 2015 gave the entire story of this lawsuit. They stated, October 8th, 2015, today we are happy to announce a monumental legal victory for Mother Jones. A judge in Idaho has ruled in our favor on all claims in a defamation case filed by a Republican donor, Frank Vandersloot and his company, Melaleuca Inc. In a decision issued Tuesday, the court found that Mother Jones did not defame Vandersloot or Melaleuca because all of the statements at issue are non-actionable truth or substantial truth. The court also found that the statements were protected as fair comment under the first amendment. This is the culmination of a lengthy, expensive legal saga that began three years ago when the 2012 presidential primaries were in full swing. On February 6, 2012, we published an article about Vandersloot after it emerged that his company, Melaleuca, and its subsidiaries had given $1 million to Mitt Romney's super PAC. The piece noted that Vandersloot had gone to unusual lengths to oppose gay rights in Idaho and that Melaleuca had run into trouble with regulators. Vandersloot's lawyers sent us a letter complaining about the article. We reviewed their concerns and posted a correction about a few details. So far, not an uncommon scenario. It's 
something every newsroom deals with from time to time. But that September, we broke the story of Romney's 47% comments, which some have argued cost the GOP the White House. Four months later, Vandersloot, who was also one of Governor Mitt Romney's national finance chairs, filed a defamation lawsuit against Mother Jones, as well as Stephanie Mensheimer, the reporter of the article, and Monica personally for her tweet about the piece. People have asked us whether we think the two things are connected, and the honest answer is we have no idea. What we do know is that the take no prisoners legal assault from Vandersloot and Melaleuca has consumed a good part of the past two and a half years and has cost millions, yes, millions in legal fees. This was not a dispute over a few words. It was a push by a super rich businessman and donor to wipe out news coverage that he disapproved of. This article is a really long one and I can't tell you the entire story or we'd be here for a long while. But if you do want to check it out, I highly recommend you do and take a look at my sources down below for it. Now, I know there's going to be some people that are going to hear this and go, oh, there goes Blair criticizing Republicans again. And I wanna make it clear that this isn't a political issue. I don't think there's anything political as saying someone who's gay and someone who's straight should have the same opportunities to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, portions of things that make up the American dream, right? I really don't care who made these statements, if it was Vandersloot or not. I don't really care. If the person who said this supported a democratic person instead, I'd still criticize them because these statements are messed up. Vandersloot happens to be a Republican who supports Republican candidates, as well as, you know, did some other shady things that we're bringing to light but that's it. The way he's tried to suppress free speech is honestly, it's gross, but of course, we're still not done yet. Now I've been building to this case because it makes me probably the most angry of everything that I knew if I put it too early in the video, I probably would not be able to be unbiased for the rest of my research. And it would probably just be filled with me cursing a lot. Not only does Vandersloot sue his critics, he outs them as well. And yes, you heard me correctly. One reporter named Peter Zuckerman worked on a six part expose of the Boy Scouts published by the Post Register. This was in 2006 and the Post Register is a pretty small paper with only about 26,000 readers at the time. As one site reports, First came the tip. A pedophile caught at a local scout camp in 1997 had not had two victims as we reported at the time. He had dozens. When we went to the courthouse to look for the civil suit filed by these victims, the clerks and the computers said there was no such case. We later learned that the National Boy Scouts of America and its local Grand Teton Council had hired two of Idaho's best connected law firms to seal the files and hide what became known as the Brad Stowell case. The Post Register went to court in late 2004 and by January, 2005, we dragged the case file into the light of day and read it from beginning to end. Turns out that as early as 1991, scout leaders had been warned about Stowell. They hired him anyway. Top level local and national leaders of the Mormon church, which sponsors all of Grand Teton's council scout troops had also been warned, but to no effect. From these files, we learned that while under investigation, Stowell confessed his problem to his bishop in 1988 and had been sent to church counselors for sex abuser treatment. Seven years later, this bishop told scout executives he knew of no reason Stowell should not be a scout camp leader. The files also showed lawyers for the Boy Scout organization knew about more victims, but never told those boys' parents. The victims were probably asleep at the time, one lawyer said, and even if not, it was a bad memory best ignored. In February, 2005, the Post Register launched a six-day series. The first day's story featured a 14-year-old camper, Adam Steed, who forced adult leaders to call the cops on Stowell. Steed was the son of a more Mormon seminary teacher and a cinch to become an Eagle Scout, but he'd quit scouting and school. Instead of being praised for his efforts to stop Stowell from harming others, scout leaders and fellow scouts had shunned him for bringing down this man whom they described as charming and accomplished. I've already talked about the Boy Scouts on this channel before, but needless to say, they've covered up a lot of pedophilia in their past and a lot of it, but this time it involved the Mormon church. So you can see why I mentioned Vandersloot's religion earlier. Vandersloot was furious. Even though these articles received the scripts Howard for distinguished service to the first amendment and there was evidence to back it up, he didn't care. He bought numerous full page newspaper ads in the post register and attacked the reporter. He called Zuckerman a homosexual when Zuckerman was considering he was living in rural Idaho where that was less accepted and trying to keep that a secret. Apparently Zuckerman had been out when he was writing for a small Florida paper since he was accepted there. But since moving, Zuckerman kept it all private. So first of all, fuck you, Vandersloot. 
Secondly, I kind of wonder why the hell the post register would publish those ads. Like these ads were attacking someone. Couldn't they refuse on the grounds of it was literally like slandering their own reporter? As one article puts it, Vandersloot's full page ad expressly described the speculation about Zuckerman's homosexuality that had made him hostile to the scouts and LDS. The Boy Scouts position of not letting gay men be scout leaders and the LDS church's position that marriage should be between a man and a woman may have caused Zuckerman to attack the scouts and the LDS church through his journalism. While the ad abruptly sought to repudiate the very speculation about Zuckerman, which it had amplified, we think it would be very unfair for anyone to conclude that that is what is behind Zuckerman's motives. The predictable damage was done. Zuckerman's editor, Dean Miller explained, our reporter, Peter Zuckerman was not out to anyone but family, a few colleagues at the paper, including me and his close friends. But after Vandersloot outed him to his community in that ad, strangers started ringing Peter's door at midnight. His partner of five years was fired from his job. What Vandersloot did not only had real serious consequences, but it was so, so not his place to do it. I'm sure you guys can see why I waited till we were closer to the end of today's episode to reveal this because I'm a little upset. I'm just, I'm just gonna say. I'm a little upset right now. Now, Vandersloot had insisted that he didn't out him because after all, in Florida, Zuckerman told the public he was gay. Even if that was the case, using someone's homosexuality as a weapon in an area where it isn't accepted is disgusting. And judging by Vandersloot's long history of being anti-LGBTQ+, that, you know, this pitiful excuse doesn't exactly go over well. His wife, again, also donated $100,000 to Prop 8 to campaign against gay marriage in California. So I think it's fair to say they don't like gay people very much. Now, of course, Vandersloot has stated, I have many gay friends whom I love and respect, and I believe they love and respect me. I am very close to some of these very good people. Our company has thousands of gay customers, independent marketing executives, and employees. I believe they feel very welcome and valued. I believe that people deserve freedom, respect, and privacy in their own lives. I believe that gay people should have the same freedoms and rights as any other individual. And honestly, I get so sick with hearing this argument. I can't be homophobic because I have a gay friend. Yes, Vandersloot, you can be homophobic and your actions show that you are. Your words, very pretty, very nice, but your actions, they're ugly. Plus, if he believes that gay people should have the same rights, then why does he say marriage should only be between a man and a woman? That's denying gay rights, and that's essentially saying straight people and gay people are not on the same level. If you're gonna be homophobic, at least be honest about it, because these lies are really easy to catch. Vandersloot bullies his critics, to say the very least. There's other journalists he's done this to as well, mainly around 2012, when he was heavily involved in the Romney campaign. Around that time, he was also audited, but he blames the timing and implied that there was a connection to his campaigning. Ultimately, the audits found no wrongdoing, but hey, this is what happens when you run an MLM. Questionable business deals seem a bit commonplace in these circles. Now, Vandersloot has been relatively quiet since 2012, aside from that Mother Jones lawsuit I mentioned earlier, bullying another critic or two and vocalizing his support for Trump because he said Trump was the only person who could beat Clinton. Most of his misdeeds have been in 2012 or earlier though, so that's why the main focus earlier on is about him, but now we're going to go back to his company. What has Melaleuca been up to now? Well, in June, 2020, according to one article, Melaleuca Inc. terminated a marketing agreement with a Texas woman the same day the Federal Trade Commission sent a warning letter to the Idaho Falls company. In its letter Friday, the FTC ordered the wellness products maker to stop representatives from making unsubstantiated earnings claims that they sought to recruit new sellers during the coronavirus pandemic. CEO Frank Vandersloot, whose success building Melaleuca has made him Idaho's richest man, told the Idaho Statesman that the woman had been an independent marketing executive for Melaleuca for 14 years and made improper claims. He declined to identify her. The FTC letter, which did not name her, said social media posts by the woman claimed that new Melaleuca representatives are likely to earn substantial income. A Facebook post by the woman cited by the FTC said prospective representatives could earn $400 a month from 20 customers spending $100 a month. The new representatives would earn 20% as their share. This income will never go away, the post said. And I'm sorry, but I had a good chuckle over this. This woman went on Facebook, shouted to the world about how Melaleuca is so amazing and her income would never go away. And the FTC told Melaleuca to quit it with the claims and they got rid of her. The irony, it's palpable. Like, 
Sorry, but you kind of deserved it for making statements like that when Melaleuca doesn't have the income disclosure to back that up. And we will get to those numbers momentarily. The FTC also told Melaleuca to quit it with the claims because of how some Huns were calling the company recession proof, even though they've been around before 2008. Just because a company is more than 13 years old doesn't make them recession proof. Like they survived as many companies have, but they struggled too. Hell, sales went down in 1998 because their top senior executives simply stopped caring. Vandersloot has long railed against categorizing Melaleuca as a multi-level marketing company. Those companies, which include Amway and Herbalife, had distributors who buy an inventory of products and make most of their money from products sold by other distributors they have recruited. On its website, Melaleuca says 81% of the people who buy its products are strictly customers, not salespeople. It says one in nine customers develop a Melaleuca business. Of course, 89.7% average of $2,209 in annual income, while 3.2% earn $9,000 $476 per year on average. Top earners less than 0.1% in total earn an average of $1.2 million. The FTC was absolutely right to notify us of this marketing executive's Facebook posts, Vandersloot said in a message sent Friday to the company's other independent marketing executives. Melaleuca has more than 120,000 marketing executives in the United States and Canada. More than 600,000 customers buy products from the company each month, he said. Business has been booming, Vandersloot said, Melaleuca had its best March, April, and May in its nearly 35 years of business. The company sold more hand sanitizer in March than it usually sells in a year. And that's a bit of a distasteful brag when it comes to like why they were selling them much because that was the start of the pandemic, but like, Okay. Regardless of how Melaleuca hypes itself up and claims to cooperate with the FTC, their income disclosure proves that their opportunity is minimal at best. Also, their income disclosure was difficult as hell to read because they went by percentages of who they claim are employees and not customers. So the 8% that they say are just advocates actually make up the majority of their employees because they are saying 81% are customers. It's really difficult to get through and math is not my strong suit in school, still not my strong suit now. So I went to another source that broke these numbers down and here's what they said. According to their income disclosure for 2018, directors level one and two earn an average income of about $2,000 per year with eight customers. As far as I understand it, that means to add $160 to your monthly household income, you need to be selling Melaleuca products to eight people. However, the average earnings of a company might not give you the entire picture of what's going on. Median income is much more revealing, but they don't tell us that. Why use median income instead of average income? The classic example is that there are 10 people in a room who each earn $1 per day. Bill Gates walks in and he earns $1 million per day. The average income of the group jumps to $91,000. The median is still $1. Regardless, it does appear that you can make up to $39,900 $187, according to their report, as a director level one or two without recruiting at all. They do not say how many customers you'd need to achieve that kind of income, but they do say it's done with eight to 16 personal customers and eight to 75 active customers. They don't tell us the difference between active and personal customers, so there may be some kind of auto ship involved there, but that's just a guess. Point is, Melaleuca's income is all over the place and it really doesn't reveal that much. I'd say it's a safe assumption that their figures are similar to any other MLM we've covered, but I can't state that for sure. And I really don't want Vandersloot coming after me if I do. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Now, aside from their claims, their numbers and the homophobia, there have also been a few recent lawsuits. One is actually from ItWorks, another MLM that I've discussed on the YouTube channel many months ago. They filed a lawsuit against Melaleuca as of August, 2020 for allegedly luring its salespeople away and using confidential information to sabotage the company. Melaleuca encourages its distributors to solicit and or poach distributors from competing companies through the use of deceptive claims regarding the income that potential distributors could reasonably expect to receive, the ItWorks complaint reads. ItWorks claims former distributors have breached non-compete agreements and some are trying to recruit current distributors to work for Melaleuca. During a July recruiting video conference, one defendant allegedly said she had friends in ItWorks corporate who told her to run the lawsuit states. In some cases, the distributor defendants peddled misleading claims about their success with Melaleuca while encouraging ItWorks distributors to not only break their own agreements, but also to solicit other current ItWorks distributors to move to Melaleuca and shrink their contractual obligations to ItWorks as well, the lawsuit reads. And I just can't bring myself to care too much, honestly. 
MLM versus MLM lawsuits tend to revolve around, they stole my distributors and company information, but since both businesses are pretty horrible, it's kind of a lose-lose either way. Now, this isn't Melaleuca's only lawsuit, of course. Terry Dorfman and Ken Dunn have also spoken out against the company. The whole story for this is also down in the sources, but from Business for Home, the lawsuit is one for wrongful termination. The judgment seems to have gone against Melaleuca here, but there's not a ton of information about the outcome, and it all seemingly took place in 2010, so there's probably not gonna be new info here. And look, I'll try to be fair here and say, yes, Melaleuca and Vandersloot have done some good as well. They've made donations to schools, delivered supplies to shelters after Hurricane Katrina, contributed to an orphanage in Ecuador, all under the Melaleuca Foundation name. Considering that his net worth as of writing this is three and a half billion dollars, I'd say the actions are pretty minimal though, and they don't make up for the despicable things Vandersloot has done. He's still not the worst CEO I've come across, and that should be absolutely saying something, but he is up there. I know today was probably a bit more about him than Melaleuca, but for anyone that may be trying to convince a friend or family member not to join Melaleuca, just send them this and ask if they really wanna put their money and sales towards this guy because the money eventually does make its way back to his wallet. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. Thank you so much for joining me for another Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to hit that like button. And if you're new here, make sure to subscribe as well. If you want to see all my sources I used to create today's video, as well as my link tree, where it has links for all of my social media, Discord, all that stuff, links will be in the description box. So thank you so much for making it to another video. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.